they know the individual. They know the individual mm -hmm. and they're going to be there after the treatment team. So to have the family involved and have everyone offering what they know and then coming up with, okay, how do we best proceed? It's, it's pretty similar. <laughs> Welcome to New Plates Podcast. I'm Laura Collins Listermensch of Circumensum. I'm an author, a mental health advocate, and a mom. My passion is mobilizing families for lasting eating disorder recovery, better outcomes, and resilient families. Here are the rules here at New Plates. We will assume that parents are doing the best they know how. We will assume clinicians and clinics are doing the best they know how. And we'll assume everyone can do even better together if they know how. Welcome to episode 11 of New Plates Podcast. We have two guests today, the Cortese mother-son team at the helm of GERS Salucor. I'm back from the IADEP conference on eating disorders in Vegas with a few important lessons. One, I don't miss indoor smoking. Two, I'm too old for red-eye flights. Three, eating disorder professionals are way smarter and more fun than average people. I'm just saying. Yeah. Let's say that you are new to eating disorders. You're looking for books and information about the topic, and you quickly realize that the topic is both specific and wide. You need specialized information about this particular problem, and you want to see the breadth of what's available. But you thump around on the internet, you can't find both, a source that specializes in eating disorders but also has the full range of options. And then you find GERS Salucor, and you have both. It's a company that has been around so long it predates the words that we use to define the disorders. It's a company that pioneered the specialized literature of eating disorders. It was started by a family, a husband and wife, who pretty much created the specialty. And when I started in the eating disorder world as an author and an advocate, I had arrived when Gers chose my first book, Eating With Your Anorexic, for its catalog. At every eating disorder conference or event, there was a GERS table. Pretty much every resource out there could be found in their catalog. And if you stop by the table, Lee and Lindsay knew every resource personally quite well. When the couple retired from the catalog and found new owners for the popular website and catalog, another family took it on, Kathy and Mike Cortese. I thought it would be neat to introduce you to the Corteses as it fits into my theme here at New Plates of collaboration and families. Plus, I subscribe to their podcast and I want you to as well. Keeping up to date on eating disorders is hard. Listening to podcasts is easy. Meet the Corteses. Good morning, Kathy and Mike. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. What did you both have for breakfast this morning? I had raspberries and I still have leftover Irish soda bread because I'm a big fan of that with some butter and my little concoction of orange and cranberry juice. That is what I had for breakfast. Oh, I'm on my way over. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to make breakfast for my son and I. He's just over one years old. So we had scrambled eggs and some toast and banana and strawberries. So it was a, it was a good one for us. <laughs> Bright, shiny breakfasts. That's lovely. So Please tell us a little bit about the work that you two do together. Well, it's an interesting journey uh, because Mike witnessed me <laughs> throughout his lifetime working as a clinician and specializing in the field of eating disorders. So as we are collaborating on this, we each bring our special blend, but the opportunity to uh, purchase the GERS catalog from Lee Cohn and Lindsay Hall came up in 2013, and we finalized that in October of that year because I found it an invaluable resource, and I couldn't see the field without it, and so I pitched it to Mike. So that's kind of how we got here. 
Mm -hmm. So we, you know, publish the catalog yearly and we have a pretty robust website. We got all of the content from what was bulimia.com from Lee and Lindsay. And we have been adding to that website, which is now at edcatalog.com, including a monthly newsletter and a number of other things, which we will discuss, I'm sure, later on this call. One notable thing is that you two uh, produce a podcast. That was Mike's idea because he is young. <laughs> so I, I pass this over, Mike. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're looking for different ways to connect with our audience and, and grow our audience. And one of the things that, you know, as a younger person, I, I don't think I'm that young, but, um, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I thought it would be a perfect medium for, you know, different groups of individuals to listen to. And whether that's um, an individual who has a question about their loved one who may have an eating disorder or an individual who has a friend or, or an individual themselves who just wants to learn more as well as clinicians, I thought it would be a great way for people to, you know, listen to 20, 25 minute podcasts, learn about eating disorders. Unfortunately, I don't think people read as much as I would like them to. So I don't think people are consuming as much on the internet as potentially in the past. So I think it's just an, another great way to connect with people and educate. Absolutely. I am a subscriber to your podcast. What's the name of the podcast? Uh, it's called ED Matters. So there's kind of a, a double entendre there within the uh, the title. It's very catchy. I like it. And it's subtitled as Healthy Conversations About Eating Disorders. These are kind of uh, old and new media that you're getting involved in. You have actual things that people can buy and hold in their hands and, and read, and also this very new digital media. And you yourselves are mother and son. You're mm -hmm. from different generations by definition. Right. What do you both bring to this collaboration that is making it work? I started in the field on an eating in on a unit in a psych hospital back in 1989, and I kind of never left the eating disorder community, moving from the psych hospital to an inpatient eating disorders unit, then in the private practice of a psychiatrist who specializes in eating disorders, then to my own private practice. So the good news is the type of exposure that I have had the opportunity to experience over these years that allowed me to see a lot of different aspects of eating disorders, their mm -hmm. complexities, the medical piece big time, and then also working with families and being able to be part of that experience too. So it's a pretty, I would say, robust uh, exposure that allows me to hopefully do a good job with my knowledge. And I think, you know, that's where it's useful to me, certainly, when I'm inviting people to write, whether it's for the catalog or the e-newsletter, or I'm doing a book interview for the e-newsletter, or whether I'm interviewing someone on the podcast, in, in addition to which I maintain, <laughs> to the best of my ability, because there's so much information out there, I try to stay as current as possible in terms of what's happening on the front lines with you know, research and uh, collaborative efforts, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> she she has a she has a, a big job. I mean, she is not to simplify it, but she is in charge of content. So, you know, content creation, content selection, sourcing content. She heads our committee who researches and uh, chooses the books that go into the catalog each year, which is a monumental task. So, you know, we rely on her expertise and uh, you know, with working with groups of others to to help curate all that information. Whereas I am more of the business side of things. So that is making sure the catalog is printed, that it's delivered, that it is sent out on time. And then, you know, trying to develop new mediums within building up our website and, you know, the podcast and different things of that nature uh, too. So we have a very healthy, I think, kind of separation and, and division within our roles. So while we collaborate extensively on everything that we do, the, there's good division lines where 
I know where my lane is and she knows where her lane is and, and we stay in our lanes for the most part. I, I hear you you saying that you have these different spheres. Would you say that the generational thing that one of you being older and younger that uh, you're bringing to that different approaches to how to use these different types of media? I would say so. Like you said, by definition, growing up as a younger person, I'm more used to using the internet and iPhones and podcasts and this and that. So for me and my thinking, it, it certainly helps me kind of push us in that direction. And Kathy is great at saying mostly, okay, just <laughs> explain, explain what I need to do and, and then we can do it. Uh, so that, that works out very well. Yeah, I, I would say a, a great um, example of sort of the freshness that Mike brings is uh, this 2017 catalog has a, a new design to a degree. And that was something that he thought would connect well. And we've we've gotten really like very energetic responses in a very positive way. Like, Oh, I love this now. I I'm reading it cover to cover. And you know, that's great to hear because our authors work very hard to bring their expertise to the catalog. So I I'm always thrilled when I hear that people are really enjoying it. Over the time that you've been in the field, Kathy, the eating disorders world has changed. It's not just mm -hmm. the tech, but um, a lot of things have changed. Correct. And Mike, you're newer to it. Can I hear from both of you a little bit about the changes in the field and how that affects the work that you're trying to do to get out information about the field? Well, f certainly over time, awareness has become sort of a, the, the call to arms. And uh, the field as a whole is working and has been working and doing great I, I, I think just, you know, in terms of advocacy and fundraising, et cetera, et cetera, since the, well, I'll call them the darker days of 1989, that um, people, for example, then uh, didn't talk very much about the neurobiology or genetics. There was no formal DBT or FBT. Um, binge eating disorder was not recognized as an illness. Uh, stigma was and still exists. Shame still exists. Guilt continues. Families still blame themselves despite many people's efforts to encourage that to sort of disappear. People were afraid of eating disorders. People didn't understand that that continues. The good news is, is that I think we are reaching more and more people uh, that there are populations, for example, that went unrecognized and didn't have access to care. So people are being encouraged to uh, to have a much more inclusive model and just appreciate the struggles of all people and not just sort of have this myth of, you know, that upper middle class, upper class white female, because mm -hmm. that's not at all the case. And that's something that time has taught us. We have the good news of telemedicine, because there are some people that really have, you know, uh, the nearest provider is 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. We have body composition analysis through bioelectrical impedance analysis, which is really phenomenal, mm -hmm. and I think can really help people in terms of their recovery. And then we just have much more people on board providing the hope and skills for recovery, which I truly believe is possible. Hmm. How about you, Mike? For me, it's it's more of a question of the evolution. And, and like, you know, I've only been in this for four and a half years now. When we first started the magazine, you know, the catalog, we call it a magazine. It, it was enough, you know, and it and it. In many ways, it, it is still is, in my estimation, because it is such a great resource, but it's also not enough in terms of people are consuming more and more information. They want more information, which is a great thing because of, you know, the awareness and the work that is being done. We need to provide more information. It needs to be high quality information, of course, but but that's for me, my what I've seen as the evolution is we need to be doing more to help more people. So that's, you know with the podcast, with different services that we can offer, you know, that people need more, people want more. So we need to do more to, to try to help them. So I um, have been around in the field long enough to have known Lindsay and Lee. Um, mm -hmm. And they were 
icons, much admired in the field. And they themselves, like you described, they went, they saw the field come from a time when actually we didn't even have the word bulimia, uh, a very fledgling field to a fully developed literature, partially because of GERS, uh, and also a library of content. So you've taken on this project, uh, a great legacy. What are you hoping that for the both of you, your legacy will be when you turn this over to others? <laughs> well, first off, I want to express my appreciation to Lee and Lindsay for what they did bring to the field. Um, personally and professionally, I think they left a mark that is truly indelible. And we were very humbled when they selected us to carry on their work. And it is a humbling task. Hopefully, people will see Gurs Salyukor as a quality resource so that they know whether it's something that they've never heard of or something they want to learn more about, that we are viewed as a resource in the field uh, for education, support, hope for recovery, and that people will want to continue that on. I couldn't agree more. And just to add on a little bit, I, I basically want to emphasize the, you know, the trust and we want to be a trusted resource and, and leave that. And hopefully we don't leave this for a very long time. I mean, we're, we're in this for a million different reasons. There's a ton of different things on the internet. There's a ton of different things in print. And how do you know what's good, what's not good, what is okay, what's right, what's not? So, you know, it, it's a trust, it's a, it's a relationship, and, and we want to just continue um, forging the relationships that Lee and Lindsay started years ago and continue to grow and develop new ones. That's actually a really good question, and maybe I'd like to throw that out to you too. How does a family know the difference between good and not so good information on the internet or or printed or on a podcast? Mm, yes, I appreciate that. Well, we think it's useful when we do print our catalog and also the e-newsletter. We include a bio of the people who have been featured and shared. And hopefully, you know, people read credentials and credentials can be credentials or credentials, mm -hmm. but there are, there are some certification processes, certainly that people have taken the time to invest in uh, the type of, you know, there, there are academics that we draw from and hopefully people can get a sense. I also think there's reputations and hopefully people are asking. And if people were to go to um, some of the websites, for some of the individuals, they might be able to see the different conferences that people have presented. Uh, and I think knowing, for example, that people have presented at some of the different uh, professional conferences, that would be useful because those people are obviously screened before their presentations, workshops are approved. Uh, so I think there are a number of ways, but I, I guess there's also a gut feeling. It's kind of like when you connect with um, a therapist <laughs> and you, you, you go, oh, yeah, um, you know, this person gets me. I feel comfortable with this. And hopefully there's a human element, if you will, to some of what we offer so that people can actually feel, you know, we see you as people. And we want to respond to you as people and, you know, take in your needs. I don't know. Mike, thoughts? Yeah, I, I think generally, and, and this is such a great question, I, I think it is a challenge for people who are looking for information. Like, how do you really discern whether this is good, this is right, this is wrong? Even, you know, there's a lot of, as we all know, eating disorders are not black and white. There's a lot of gray they're different for every individual. There's different treatments that work for certain people. And so I, I think, and you know, this, this is a topic that's a, you know, a broader topic about the internet in general. How do we know what is good information? How do we know what's true with, you know, fake news? We hear this all the time. Mm. I, I think it's important to ask questions and whether that is like Kathy said, reading the bio and then doing further research on the author or digging deeper and seeing if they've presented a conference or, or going to a therapist saying, I read this, what do you think? Or, or talking to a physician or whatever it may be. We all can't just read something, say that's the truth. The person, they, they had a PhD, that's what we do. We all need to be smarter than that. We all need to ask questions because that's how we make progress. 
you know, to summarize, I, I think it's hard and people need to do a little work, but, but it's not insurmountable. It's pretty easy to, to ask a question, to look someone up and, and then continue the conversation. I think that's the most important thing. Well, you are information sources, so there you are. The theme of this podcast of New Plates is collaboration. It's collaboration between family and the treatment world. And here you are, a mother and son collaborating. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice from the perspective of running a family business that serves our, the eating disorder community? And if possible, if there's anything analogous to how families collaborate in eating disorder treatment, ideally. It, it's funny, you know, obviously I've known my mother my whole life and we have, we have a good relationship and that is certainly helpful. My wife jokes with me because I used to work with my father in a family business. <laughs> I went from one family business to another and both businesses have been nothing but wonderful and great experiences for me. My wife jokes, though. She's like, you know, there's other people out there you can work with, <laughs> and even though she loves my parents and couldn't be happier for me. But I, I think for working in a family business, there are challenges because you don't necessarily just go home at night, you know, even though we live in different places. You know, the, my mom's always a phone call away, and there's not necessarily always a dividing line between work and family in that, you know, if she calls to check on my son to see how he's doing and then, you know, oh yeah, wait, we got to talk about this and blah, blah, blah. And so I think just circling back to what I originally was saying about how we kind of have good divisions in, in what our work is. And I mostly stay in my lane and Kathy mostly stays in her lane. If, if you're getting into family business, I think that is really important to be able to have those clearly roles clearly defined um, so there isn't too much overlap where then there can become issues. Communication is obviously vital to any relationship, but especially a working relationship. And then I think boundaries are, are important and need to be set as well, where not just boundaries in terms of who's working on what, but in terms of when are we working? I mean, there's times when I want something right away and Kathy's busy doing something else and I need to understand and accept that and vice versa. And that can be challenging sometimes because, it, you know, at the end of the day, I'm picking up the phone, calling my mom, being like, mom, we need this. And I, you know, whether I'm asking for something work related or I'm like, James needs this or that, like it, you have to do some work to to divide those a little bit and understand that there needs to be some lines and and we can't just get everything right away when we want them. Well, I'm going to be able to dovetail pretty easily from mm -hmm. that. So thank you, Michael. Um, in terms of uh, sort of the analogies to families collaborating in a business and in, and eating disorder treatment, I'm, I'm actually pleased to hear some of your terms that you use because when families are working on recovery of somebody, I believe it is a full collaborative effort that uh, throughout my experience in the field, I've always been a member of a treatment team and the treatment team always included families and the individual with the diagnosis. Everybody comes to a treatment team with a specific area of expertise and by nature, there are certain boundaries that, that come with that, but that doesn't mean that people don't develop this collaborative spirit. Communication obviously is a key, just mm -hmm. like in a family business. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to siblings, parents, you know, they have as much worth and perhaps sometimes more than somebody with the, the letters after their name because they know the individual, they know the individual, they know the individual, mm -hmm. and they're going to be there after the treatment team. So to have the family involved and have everyone offering what they know and then coming up with, okay, how do we best proceed? It's, it's pretty similar. <laughs> so I don't know. Th those are some thoughts. Mike, do you have anything else to add? Like I said, I've, I've worked with my father and I work with my mother now, and, and they both have been great experiences. If you're getting involved in family business, you just need to know what you're getting into. The lines of separation are blurred. It's challenging, but I would recommend it if your relationship is in, in the right place because it, it can be extremely easy to work with people you're related to. Um, at least in my experience, I know not everyone has that experience, but um, as long as the relationship is there and comfortable, 
I, I would say go ahead. Um, just make sure, you know, there is one boss and everyone knows who the one boss is. And I, I won't say who the boss is on this in this <laughs> collaboration. Are you having fun? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I think uh, the eating disorder community as a whole, not just a treatment team, very much can act just like a, a big gigantic treatment team because we have been, first of all, we have been welcomed with open arms and warm hearts by everybody, which I say, mm. thank you, thank you, thank you to all of them. Laura, you included. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. That people are genuinely generous in terms of wanting to learn and offer their thoughts. And we're most appreciative of that. And there's a lot of respect. And all of that has to be part of, I think, recovery uh, when there's families involved that we want that, you know, worth, value, respect, um, input, insight, all there. And as Michael's grows, can I just say one little cute thing that his interest, it, you, you know, he's, he's, he's growing and he's taking more and more interest, which is wonderful as he learns. And he is an active member of the junior board of NIDA. And mm -hmm. obviously I think they're going to benefit from what he can bring to us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. How can listeners reach you and learn more about what you're doing? Uh, the easiest way is through our website. So it's edcatalog.com, and that's spelled E-D-C-A-T-A-L-O-G-U-E.com. And that's where you can find information to sign up for our newsletter. You can uh, listen to our podcast, which... Laura was gracious enough to join us, and hers will be airing uh, in the next month or two. You can and you can reach us via email. It's uh, the easiest way is through gers at edcatalog.com. So it's g u r z e at e d c a t a l o g u e dot com. We're happy to hear all sorts of feedback, um, positive, negative, neutral um, suggestions. We really um, are interested in hearing from people. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us. I happen to know that is absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> and also um, to to just uh, know that there's lots of information uh, that uh, Mike has different categories under the, uh, I guess you call that a header, learn. And there's lots of information that people can read to just sort of enhance their understanding of things, uh, whether it comes to specifics of a particular diagnosis or other elements in the treatment and recovery of eating disorders. Fantastic. Kathy, Michael, thank you very much for your time and for what you do for the community. Laura, thank you for your interest. You are a dear in so many ways. Yeah, thank you for having us and for all the work that you're doing as well. Before I go, a few eating disorder news items that you might want to check out. See the show notes at Circumensum for links. One is... Check the news about the phase two trials on the drug naloxone for bulimia nervosa. It works on the so-called reward pathways in the brain that are also implicated in opioid abuse. Also in the show notes, a link to a study on neuroendocrinology and brain imaging that deepens our insights into the role that leptin and ghrelin may play in both anorexia and bulimia nervosa as part of a homeostatic adaptation to altered energy balance, and again, reward circuits. Both of the above strike me as more of what I heard Dr. Julie O'Toole from the Cartini Clinic say in her recent episode on Tabitha Farrar's podcast, that we keep talking about the why of eating disorders, but really it's time for us to be clarifying the how, because we really do actually know a great deal about the how eating disorders work. But most treatments, and this is my editorial comment, not something from that podcast, most treatment concentrates on reversing whatever the clinical team thinks is the why. And that generally seems to be thought of as why someone wanted to be thin or wanted control or was traumatized or didn't feel good about themselves. 
But all that aside, we really are getting a better grip on how the eating disorder works biologically. And in my opinion, that's probably a far better and more effective target for treatment. On one more news note, an open source article, which means you can read the whole thing, not just an abstract and not just if you're a fellow academic, it's in the Journal of Eating Disorders. The lead author is Dr. Rebecca Peebles at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The title is A Snoozer, I Confess. It is Outcomes of an Impatient Medical Nutritional Rehabilitation Protocol in Children's and Adolescents with Eating Disorders, but the content may just be revolutionary. Do you ever wonder what goes on in an evidence-based, parent-involved inpatient unit? This article gives all the deets and encouraging news on outcomes for patients. It addresses the so-called start low, advance slow approach that has been dogma in eating disorders for a long time, and also team collaboration and discharge planning. We need more of this kind of publication. Thank you for listening in on this episode 11 of New Plates Podcast. You can subscribe through iTunes or other podcast apps. You can sign up on the website to receive an email when new episodes come out. And if you care about eating disorders and you care about families and what we can do about eating disorders, go to iTunes and rate or review this podcast or any podcast. Please listen to podcasts. Please review podcasts. The website here is circummensum.com. I'm Laura Collins, Mr. Mench. This is New Plates Podcast signing off. Them thinking.